that God is not actually masculine in essence, but try calling God she, and we see that it matters very much suddenly. Not only that, but we attempt to use more inclusive language about God by attributing to God stereotypically feminine characteristics sometimes, gentle or nurturing. We understandably and rightly identify in Jesus' parables, for example, the explosive growth of the mustard seed buried in the earth, the mustard seed, the fastest growing seed in the Middle East, as a parable for the birth of the new age, nurtured in the womb of humanity. And we claim for that argument that feminine sensibilities are at the heart of Jesus' teaching about the new age. It is absolutely classical Christian theology that all names for God are simply analogies. The tradition of negative <coughs> theology emphasises the unlikeness between God and human words for God. And that tradition, that long and noble tradition, corrects our tendency to take the verbal images literally or to turn them into stone. God is like, but also absolutely unlike anything we might say about God. Imagery and language, of course, shapes our perceptions and shapes our face. It moulds our imaginations and forms pictures in our mind's eye. Let's see if we can get away from the pedantry that confines us and usher in a generous-spirited, open-minded, faithful imagination. Janet Morley, who has done an incredible amount to contribute to a more inclusive language in the church, has written this. Religious language cannot but be metaphorical in character, that is, pointing in an imaginative way to a reality that is in the end unsayable. What makes metaphor a particularly appropriate vehicle of religious truth is that it works in two ways at once. First, it offers a vivid, illuminating comparison. There's a sort of imaginative explosion brought about by putting together two ideas unexpectedly. So, for example, it's powerful and helpful to call God a rock because God is like a rock in important ways <coughs> and because it would hardly be possible to confuse God with a rock. <laughs> God is like a rock, but it's not possible to confuse God with a rock. That's why an image can be used and then let go, which is how we should treat all religious language, argues Janet Morley. Inclusive language, like inclusive theology, is not a churchy version of political correctness, as Giles Fraser has recently said. It's rooted in specific calls for justice, in the authorised language of the Church of England in common worship, the issue of gender-inclusive language was addressed for the first time in the early 80s. In 1988, as many of you here will know and have been involved in, Making Women Visible was published. And in Crafting Common Worship, published in 2000, the principles were established, and this is on the issue of gender, first, to provide gender-inclusive terms where the old alternative service book, for those of you who are Anglicans, had exclusive ones. Second, to advocate that all new texts should be written with sensitivity to gender. And third, to provide a number of additional texts that affirm the feminine. For example, St Anselm's Canticle, Jesus as a mother you gather your people to you. And in morning and evening prayer, uh, at the beginning and end of this day, we're using common worship texts as well as other texts that are gender at least inclusive. Just to uh, help us to suggest within our real contexts that there are already authorised texts. So we're not doing anything completely, we're not being iconoclasts here. We're, we're simply mining the tradition as it is and there are texts that are available for us to suggest in our congregations and PCCs and, and church communities. Common worship uses these principles, but in two important ways, leaves language what we might call exclusive. First of all, it prefers to leave historic Book of Common Prayer texts unamended, alongside the new inclusive material. That's a decision made by the church's official liturgists, 
in the Anglican Church, the Liturgical Commission. And second, along with the decision that while all new texts should reflect inclusive descriptions of people, this should not be extended to God, who would continue to be referred to as He. So for example, in common worship, the tradition is used to provide inclusive canticles, for example, at services of the Word, the Song of Hannah, the Song of Solomon, the Song of the Bride, the Song of Jerusalem, our Mother, the Song of Judas, and one version of the Benedicite. The Song of Anselm, the Song of Ephraim the Syrian, which we used this morning, the Song of Julian of Norwich. So there are texts around, and if, for example, you want to uh, go to your own context and introduce inclusive language in a, in a way that is uh, deemed to be not threatening, <coughs> that's one very helpful way of doing it. Find what's already there before we, uh, before we go out to other writers.